When populations are distributed across the landscape, we can talk about metapopulations. Landscapes are not uniform. And because of this, because species live in places suitable for them to live, patches of appropriate habitat, most populations are divided into subpopulations. And there are several models to describe this about how these subpopulations relate to one another. The first is the metapopulation model. The next, the source sink model and finally the landscape model where barriers in the landscape may help, may inhibit and other passages help individuals move between populations. So the degree to which members of subpopulations are isolated from others in other subpopulations depends on the distance between those subpopulations the nature of the matrix, or the intervening environment, and also the mobility of the species. Before Levins proposed the existence of metapopulations in the 1960s, populations were envisioned as all functioning as one big population, but he recognized that these are really subdivided and there is dispersal among the subpopulations sporadic interactions rather than as easily as with others in the same subpopulation. Think about the deforested areas in the tropics, maybe in that biodynamics of forest fragments project in Brazil. Birds may fly across the gaps, but if it's too far, they might not, and so they, they are not only dispersing themselves, but the seeds of the plants whose fruit. So Levins proposed that a metapopulation is a population of populations with these subpopulations distributed in space, separated from each other and interacting with each other. In this picture, they're shown as uniform size, and the P and the A means present, presence or absence of the species in question. So a patch that's occupied would have individuals of the species present, and we could say that this patch has blinked on, it's occupied. If they're absent, that means, uh, one way of talking about it is that species has blinked off in that habitat patch. But of course, if a patch is if a species has gone extinct locally, it could be recolonized from another patch. So you can see that there could be benefits of a metapopulation because all of the eggs, all of the, are not in one basket. All the individuals are not just in one big population. The percentage of sites occupied in the metapopulation model is a balance between extinction, blinking out, and colonization blinking on. So in Levin's idealized model, all of the subunits exchange individuals equally. More common is probably the core satellite model, where there's a big good area that we might call the core population, and smaller satellite populations at different distances from the core. The core is the area where population, the population is in a healthy state producing lots of offspring that can colonize the satellites as migrants in a propagule rain, as it's been called. If a species blinks off, becomes locally extinct, it might be reestablished by a propagule rain. Here we see some uh, raining cats and dogs as if they are propagules. And in fact, the persistence of many species relies on metapopulations in habitat patches that are for some reason suboptimal but suitable. But for this rescue effect, the propagule rain recolonizing patches to operate, the satellite populations can't be too far away. 
In fact, a patch is more likely to be occupied the closer it is to an occupied patch or to the core population. So there are several different ways of saying this. Mainland population and islands the core and the satellites, or source and sink. And remember, that's one of the models I showed initially. They all depend on reestablishment by a density-dependent processes that operate in the source or mainland or core population where conditions are good, the population is producing a lot of new individuals that compete with each other, so some disperse, the propagules end up at other sites. In the source and sink model, the differential goodness or badness of habitats comes into play. The source patches have abundant resources, everything needed for the population to grow happily, but then with an excess of individuals competing more intensely for those resources, the extra offspring dispersed to other patches, which are called sink patches, where the resources may not be as abundant, it's harder life there, and so populations periodically go extinct, but they're maintained by immigration of individuals from other places. So you've probably heard those words, source and sink, before, maybe talking about plants primary producers that take the sun's energy and make sugars via photosynthesis. So if sugars are made in the green parts of the plant, how can you describe the movement of sugars to other parts of the plant that are not photosynthetic using this source and sink terminology? So the landscape model considers the effects not only of habitat quality in the matrix, but other landscape features, elevation, barriers, water to terrestrial species, etc. So the quality of the matrix is enhanced by resources necessary for the species to move across it, like uh, nectar and pollen for flower visitors, or materials to collect for nesting in good habitat patches. And the quality of that matrix is reduced by presence of enemies of the species in question. Some matrix habitats are better than others. Let's look a little more at the pine rockland. Shown in this picture, the lower green area, its original extent in 1900. The upper picture of 20 years ago of all of the deforestation, the change in the landscape, especially in the upper part of the range, anthropogenic habitat fragmentation. In my lab, what we've been working on for a number of years is these pine rockland plants trying to figure out if they exist as metapopulations exchanging uh, genes through pollen movement on pollinators or seeds dispersing, and with enough time and looking at historical records, we can see if species disappear from certain areas and maybe reestablish again. Our nearby or proximate goal is to look at effects of fragmentation on pollination of a variety of pine rockland plant species from generalist pollinated to more specialist pollinated. And we use those measures of pollination, like stigma, with pollen or fruit set to assess the effects of habitat fragment size and distance from other patches in species with different pollination systems. Here's Ruellia on the left, the pineland petunia in the middle, Galactia, the milk pea, and on the right, Jacamantia. This is soon to be Dr. Bete Barrios, who's studied Angadenia berteroi in the milkweed family. It sets very few fruits because it can't mate with close relatives or self-pollinate. Animals can be tracked by putting a telemetry 
device that emits a signal on their body or in their body somewhere. And studies of fish like Atlantic bluefin tuna have shown they move great distances. And this is a tagged single individual spending 1999 on the east coast of the U.S., but traversing the ocean being in northern Europe. So that's amazing information from this kind of study. These transmitters aren't always the most comfortable thing, I imagine, but here's a shoveler duck with a beak tag so people can recognize individuals from a distance with binoculars, but the transmitter to, to show where they've moved to. And here's people in a boat with an antenna to help them detect the presence of those transmitters. That technique has been used to look at movements of the resplendent quetzals, beautiful birds in the Monteverde cloud forest and throughout Central America. The male in the middle is shown with a very long tail. It doesn't, it's not all included in this photo. And on the bottom, you see a picture of the male with his puffy green head. The female is on the right with a shorter tail. And they nest in dead trees and both take care of the babies. But George Powell and colleagues tra tagged, put transmitters on, and found that the quetzals move up and down the mountains following the fruiting of their host plants, the, the fruits of the plants they disperse in the avocado family, the Lauraceae. Population size has two components, the density or the number of individuals per unit area, and if we know the area, density times the area, Occupied gives us N, the size of the population. So how can you figure out how many individuals are present in a given area? The simplest way might be to count them if the animals are really big or the trees of a certain species. Or if a population is small enough and you can distinctively mark individuals, we often use this method for endangered species, especially big animals, mammals, and birds. For organisms that are sessile, rooted to the substrate, like plants or some invertebrate aquatic animals, we can determine density in plots and then extrapolate our sample to the entire area occupied. With mobile animals that are numerous or smaller in size, we can use the mark recapture method. In this method, we collect an initial sample and mark them all. We release them into the population and let them mix with others. And then later, we collect a second sample, maybe a couple days later, a week later, and and figure out how many of the ones we capture are marked. And then we can estimate popula population size as follows. If the initial marked sample is represented by big M, the second sample, little n, and the second sample contains X marked individuals, the population size is can be figured as because little n is over big N, the number of th that we got in the second sample divided by the total population size is equal to x, the number of marked individuals divided by the original sample of marked individuals. So this leads to n if we solve for n little n times m over x. So if 20 fish were captured initially, we marked them and threw them back into OE Lake, and then the next day, a couple days later, took a second sample of 50 fish and six of them were marked, we could estimate the population size as 50 times 20 over 6 equals 167. 
Of course, sometimes you might put marks on the animals that make them more easily spotted by their predators. So they may be especially eaten, or perhaps what you use to mark them with is toxic. So you have to be careful not to do those things. But now I want you to try this problem. Going out to study a tail of butterflies one day, you catch and mark 27 of them. Two days later, you come back and catch 30, and seven of them are marked. What is your estimate of the population size, big N?